Okay, 11.03, I have Mountain Standard Time. So welcome everyone, let's go ahead and get things started. Um, very excited for today's presentation. Um, it's Data Storing Preparation Part One, Data Distillation. And we are joined by Jed Summerton. It's so exciting to have a guest speaker. So um, sitting in the same room with Jed, so very excited about um, the content that we're gonna be sharing with you today. Um, very quickly, let me share a little bit about Data Source. Uh, data Source, uh, we are a, a pure play consulting firm when it comes to data and analytics. And so it's something that we do all day, every day, and breathe at work and also outside of work, um, sitting on a number of boards. So um, we focus exclusively on enterprise data management modern data warehouse and architectures, including cloud and big data, decision intelligence, and uh, now through our parent company, EXL Services, now we also offer best-in-class data analytics through predictive modeling, machine learning, robotics, um, Internet of Things, all those cool, you know, cutting edge types of offerings. We're, we're in it. We're actually delivering on it. So very excited about that. And we divide our services um, along two paths. We've got the strategic path where we are offering roadmaps, assessments, uh, project plans, uh, environment evaluations, health checks, vendor tool evaluations and selection, strategic work, as well as the doers, the implementation teams that partner with um, your internal teams. Um, providing architecture, data integration, data quality, master data management, cloud, hybrid cloud, business intelligence, you name it, the doers that lock arms with the internal teams to deliver, right? And that, that's where the rubber meets the road. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, uh, Mr. Jed Summerton. He is a senior leader of business analytics and a strategic partner for Data Source. We've known Jed a long time. So um, his uh, credentials uh, run long. Uh, Jed specializes in applying insights of data science to improve organizational performance. Um, he has been an executive at large international IT organizations. This is when we first met him. Um, he has built analytic capabilities and data-driven results for Fortune 500 companies. And this has spanned numerous industries from healthcare to telecom, financial services, manufacturing, retail. Um, in addition to that, Jed also is a faculty member of TDWI, which stands for the Data Warehouse Institute, and currently teaches in the MBA and MSBA programs at the Daniel College of Business at the University of Denver. In addition to that, like I said, he's got numerous credentials. We're really excited to have him here. He also chairs the advisory board of the Department for Business Information and Analytics. So very excited to have him here. Um, I'm there at the bottom, Deborah Langer, your host. Uh, my job is to make sure that the webinar goes smoothly and to help facilitate. So um, with that, let's get on with it. I'm gonna pass the baton over to Jed and just a little bit about logistics. Uh, the content is roughly 40 minutes in length. And then uh, in the sidebar of your uh, GoToMeeting, you'll see um, an area for questions. So don't feel like you have to hold back on questions. If you've got a question, go ahead and type it in. Um, it will stay there until we get to the Q&A session, and then we'll facilitate through those, and hopefully we'll get through all of them. If not, we'll do the answers over email. So with that, welcome, Jet. Deborah, thank you very much for having me today, and I really appreciate uh, the, uh, the opportunity to speak with some of your uh, clients, potential clients, and the data audience uh, that's out there in the world. And the title of this webinar is Data Distillation for Non-Data Scientists. And right off the top of the bat, you might think, this is a data source consulting, an EXL company that does data science for a living. Why would we present how to do this for non-data scientists? because data scientists are very powerful. They contribute a lot of value. But this webinar is targeted at the folks who might not have an idea or might have an idea that's not fully yet fleshed out, not sure if it's ready for the data science team to come together. They might not have the resources of the data science team available at their disposal at the moment. And what they want to do is get an initial set of ideas together to present a proposal 
proposal to senior management that would be a compelling idea to deploy the data science team to develop out in a very systematic, highly rigorous way. But what we'd like to do is get started in putting our thoughts together so we can make a compelling pitch so that we do it right the first time and that we inspire people to action. So we're going to go through how do you establish the grounding, the business context, and the stakeholders, and the situation, and the goal to present a data story? And then how do you focus your data, target it to the proper business context, make sure you have your content put together in a compelling way, and then framing that for an audience that will have a find your, your narrative to be compelling and it would resonate with them and it will inspire them to move forward. And then delivering the package, which is actually the subject of a subsequent web webinar we'll have in about two weeks. So before we get started into the actual details of that, let me step back and describe what a, a data story is. And it's very much like stories that have been told since the beginning of time. There is a setup, there is a conflict or a proposal or an opportunity, and there is a resolution. And what we want to do is say the setup is the business situation that we've got that brought us to this point. The conflict or the opportunity is your new idea that you want to propose. And the resolution ideally will be adoption of your idea and endorsement of it so that you can go pursue it and make a big valuable contribution to the business. So with that in mind, data stories in a business context are about inspiring your senior leadership to action. It's a compelling narrative supported by data leading to that action. And we have to recognize that that action is really designed to lead to new value within a business. But the action, when you start doing something that's new within a corporation, that involves change. We're doing something we have never done before, or perhaps we're doing something we've done, but we're doing it differently, or perhaps there's something that we're doing that we really need to stop doing. And that is a change in the business. And whenever you make a change, it involves some type of risk, whether that risk is actual to the business because you could be making a big investment and you don't know how it's going to play out until you actually go after it. Or it could be in people's minds and the perception that, hey, I'm going to be changing something. I know what I'm doing today. I'm going to have to give that up. And I know I'm going to have to give that up. That's absolutely certain. And the gain is only a potential. So I'm going to be a little bit wary here, perhaps, and I might not necessarily want to jump on the bandwagon right away. So the goal of our data story is to show how the gain exceeds the cost and risk, that the upside is better than for the entire company as well as for the individuals. The upside is more important than the cost and the risk. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we look at the business context that we have, and we might have an idea of where there's an opportunity to improve that. And in my view, there are three components of a data story. There is, of course, the data that we start. That's the foundational element. And then we have a narrative that explains the data, and then a visual that will make that data story come to life. And I can fill in the uh, intersections of these Venn diagrams that the visuals Enlighten the data because looking at columns and rows of data, hard to uh, understand for humans. We have a visual that enlightens us as to what that story is. The narrative that will explain all that, and then the combination of all of it together is the inspiration that will take people to action. So in the center of the Venn diagram, that's where a data story happens. And in my view, all data require a story, and stories require a data to make sure that you can justify what you're saying and have compelling facts to back up your narrative and your visuals. So where do we go from that? How do we take that forward? Well, I'd say that we have to start with why are we here? What is our purpose? And then we want to move forward to impact. And the steps along the way are to describe what is going on today. And that might say, just as a metaphor, here we've got the following facts. One plus two plus three equals, that does equal six, right? Yeah, okay. And then you say, okay, well, so what? We move from the what to so what? Hey, we have an opportunity. I think we can do better. If we do that, we'll come out with the then what will we have? 
we will have one prime plus two prime plus three prime is actually greater than six. It's a better situation for the company and for all the stakeholders, both internally and externally to the company. And if you've taken folks from the what today to the so what, what's the implication or the opportunity, and on to the then what, they'll see a better tomorrow. And the next question becomes, what's the next step? So that's the now what. And that should be an action plan and request that will take us through a series of steps that will lead us from the what of today to the then what of tomorrow. And that action can change things within the business with a positive effect. That's the goal of the data story. How do we do that? Well, going back to our previous Venn diagram, we've got the business context and the data. How do we develop that into messages? Well, you've got a lot of data, but here's my question. Are your data like this, all lined up in nice, neat tables and rows, and they cover the entire earth of what you need to cover, all the ground you need to cover, and you've got it perfectly ready to go? Chances are no, because you're just getting your thoughts together for a new proposal. So sometimes your data are more like that. It's a pile of stuff. There's black and there's white and there's gray, and there's all kinds of different ambiguities and maybe potential conflicts or uh, things that don't make sense in the data. And there might be a lot of facts that are perhaps even irrelevant to your current conversation. So how do we sort through that? Well, I'd like to say that we can go from, we can use data science, and we know we can do this, we've done it many times, to take from, data, from your data pile of assorted facts through a series of steps that as a data science process of data preparation, data cleansing, data analysis, various statistical routines, various algorithms, and come out with a visualization that leads us to a new discovery or an insight. It is a very formal process. It's designed to be highly rigorous, reliable, systematic, repeatable, and will lead us to an insight that we can then take forward in the business and say, hey, we can use this to our advantage either in the market or to improve our internal business performance. So I like to say that data science is about discovering insights in a systematic, reliable, and repeatable way that makes them actionable to the business. We highly support that approach, but as I said earlier, if you don't have the access or the availability of a data science team ready for your project to do that work for you, is there a better approach? And I believe that there is. And what we're going to take is, once you have an insight from the data science, we know that we can take that into a series of messages and make a presentation. And the data storytelling is about delivering those insights to be able to take, okay, what the data science output was into an action case. But if we don't have that, is there a quicker way from going from that pile through the data, then going through the data science process into your insights and your action. And I believe that there is, and I'm going to walk you through that in the next couple of slides. So let's take a look at that. I want to distill my, vis my data visually. Instead of using algorithms, I want to use perhaps the most powerful information processing capability ever known to man, and that is your eyes and your human brain because we can distill data very quickly in ways that perhaps might take a lot of time to code in a data science environment. So I want to, conceptually, I want to show you that I'm going to take this pile of data and I'm going to first sort it by color. I'm going to use a visual technique to cluster the data into different themes. Now I could use this in the data science world in a uh, k-means clustering or any other kinds of uh, statistical techniques to do that. But I'm going to do it visually in the next couple of slides, and then I'm going to sort that into themes that are going to combine into a total proposal. So take the different colors, break them or associate them into concepts, associate the concepts into themes, and then make a proposal that then I can sort into three key messages and deliver as a presentation. And you might wonder why I keep showing the three there, because three messages enable you to set up the what, the so what, and the then what. And it's also a good number for people to remember things. If you give people five things to remember, 
the neuroscience tells us people don't remember five things. And if you only give them one thing, that can be very good, but they might not remember how you came to that. So three is a magic number for making a very concise and compelling argument. So why do we do this visually? Well, because human brains process visual is 60,000 times faster than text. You might have a Wikipedia article that describes exactly what a lion looks like, but if you see one in front of you, you know instantly. You don't have to read about it. Your, your, your human brain just processes it that much qu more quickly. And doing that visually can not only help you organize your narrative, but also convey that to others, that you can see how things fit together, how you're thinking about it. And the techniques we want to use for that are mind maps and concept maps. Mind maps are useful for organizing and figuring out what types of things might go together. And you might look at them three or four different ways to figure out which groupings or which clusters of facts make the most sense to you and your audience. And then concept maps are useful for establishing importance and hierarchy and sorting through the priorities of which facts you want to present and also showing relationships among different groups of facts. But I'll say as I take you through these uh, different techniques, that map caveats, the caveat is that mind maps and concept maps are typically working papers. They don't usually end up in your final presentation. They are just to help you sort through to lead you to the other discoveries and the messages that you want to convey. So what's that look like? Well, I want to, I want to take, through, take you through an example facts about Eagle County, Colorado. Uh, folks out there might know that Eagle County is the home of Vail Resorts, Vail Mountain and Skiing, and a lot of uh, summer fly fishing and all kinds of outdoor sports. So I thought I'd choose uh, a topic that some of you might be able to re relate to and sort that in comparison to Colorado. So I have 13 facts. I might have a database about all of these different uh, facts individually, and I'd summarize them and come out with some insights from some very basic analyses. And I put Eagle County here in Colorado. Our population, our median household income, median age, the obesity rate, lowest in the United States in both cases, poverty rate, unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. And you might scroll down a little bit farther and see uh, education level, uh, annual snowfall, we're very proud of that here in Colorado. And other assorted facts, such as the number of liquor licenses we have per capita or per thousand people. And then people per Superfund site. You might think that that's an unusual statistic, but it might be part of our data pile. And here in Colorado, we've been doing a lot of mineral mining for the last 150 years, and we didn't always do that right in the early days, and we've got some Superfund sites. So how do we sort that? I'd call that a definite just a pile of data, right? I'm going to sort that through. And we're going to sort it, we first have to think about our business context. And the business context I've chosen for this example is the perspective of public policy. If I were the county government, uh, the county council, uh, any of the officials in Eagle County, I might want to sort those data differently than if, for example, I were a, a recreational or tourist business, or if I were in the restaurant business, or if I were uh, in you know, building roads and those kinds of things. But I'm going to take it from the public policy perspective. And I'm going to start with a very simple fact. I'm going to get out some colored markers, and I'm going to list my data. And I'm just going to start marking them. I think I'm going to use the color red population. What else goes with population? Well, I'm going to color median age red. It's about that aspect of the population. The obesity rate, citizenship rate, and the education level. And I think those five things go together. And that's rough draft. Do it simply, do it quickly. Just what kind of things in your, based upon your knowledge of the business, your knowledge of the business situation, your knowledge of the data, you're going to use that supercomputer inside your head to put things that you think would logically go together. And then I'm going to take another color, purple, median household income, poverty rate, and unemployment, go through the other facts and come out with some blues and some greens. And then what I've done is taken that pile of black and white and gray data, and I sorted it by color, simply using a visual technique. And then I'm going to take that pile of color, and I'm going to put it into a mind map. And a mind map starts with the subject that we're, the perspective we're using to sort all of this, public policy, and then simply 
I label each group, demographics, health, environment, and wealth, and I put the facts from the previous page that I sorted into these various areas. And then I've got, I can step back and say, hey, I think I've done essentially a K-means clustering, but I've done it based upon concepts and simply using colored markers. And you, there's a lot of tools that are available in the market. A lot of them are free for download for mind maps and concept maps. And I just chose one, mapped it out here. And then at least I've got my data sorted into, instead of a pile, I've got it into clusters that I can actually start developing messages about. So that's a good start. That's a concept map. It's our initial approach. Then I'm going to move over into a concept map. And I'm going to say, I'm going to break those data down into it's the exact same content I had on the previous, but I'm going to break it down in, the, but I'm to, in a way that I can show relationships among them. So I've got policy, I still have health, demographics, wealth, and the environment. And I can use this, this approach to prioritize data as what comes first in the, in the hierarchy and what comes next and next. So I might have in the environment, I might have a lot of detailed data about snowfall that would be subordinate to the snowfall topic. And I can show this in a hierarchy and I can say some topics are grouped and uh, more important than others. But I can also show the additional data, the detail that goes beneath that or behind that in case someone were to ask, someone were to ask the question, well, what is the annual level of snowfall? Why is it different in Colorado overall than it is in Eagle Vale? And why is it, how fast does it melt? What rivers does it melt into? Those kinds of things. I can provide all kinds of additional detail there. But the other important aspect of a concept map is that we can show relationships among the various topics that aren't as evident in a mind map. For example, I can show that liquor licenses tend to increase the number of DUI arrests, and DUI arrests tend to reduce the number of DUI-related deaths in the county. Now, that's a hypothesis. I don't know that for sure, but it helps me think through these facts that I have and make sure that I understand how they fit together. And I could take that a step further with additional things. Education tends to increase employment. It tends to increase household income. And again, these are hypotheses which I'd want to test out with proven data science techniques to make sure that the uh, correlations are there and patterns are in the actual data that I brought to the table to start this analysis from the beginning. But there's another technique that I can do that I can derive some uh, hypothesis even further, and that's what I can say household income tends to increase or enable air creation and tourism, and in uh, Eagle County specifically, snowfall tends to encourage recreation and tourism. So I can lead to further uh, areas of data that I might want to research simply by drawing associations and connecting the dots, so to speak, among the various topics that I've got here. So again, the concept map same it starts with the same content as the mind map, and then it breaks it down into additional levels of detail if you need that, and also enables you to add relationships and associations among these different topics as you need to, uh, to make your point. So that gets us a good start to be able to say, now I've got those concepts. I've got four of them, and I've got some subordinate or one things that things that I derived, and additional concepts and additional points I want to make. But why don't I just tell them everything? I'm an engineer. I take up a lot of data in my head at once, and I make sure it all fits together. And I want to make sure you might be saying to yourself that my leadership knows really that I've done a lot of the work here, and I really have done my homework, and I really know my stuff. And I want to tell them everything I know so that they have a lot of confidence in what I'm saying. And that is a good strategy if your audience is composed of engineers. However, if your audience is composed of senior level executives, they want to hear the high points and they want to hear the what, the so what, and the now what. And I've heard it termed that executives want you to walk in, be brief, be bright, and be gone. And hopefully they'll dismiss you with <laughs> approval to proceed on your project. But if you try to tell them everything you know, that level of detail could overwhelm them and could actually subtract from your message. 
So you need to make sure that you present that, those messages in a concise format, clear uh, messages that they can remember, hopefully three in number, relevant to their understanding, relative to the business context, things that resonate with them and their responsibilities and their perspectives on the world, and, and will be clear and memorable so that when they uh, go to approve, they can follow up, give you the support you need to be able to take your project forward. So the summary is, starting from the very beginning, we want to describe the opportunity that's in front of you, understand the business context, and make sure that it makes sense from uh, the perspective of the stakeholders that you'll be proposing your action. Is this something that they will understand? Will they see the opportunity? Will they be able to move forward on the opportunity? And if you know, have, a, have an idea of what the current situation is, and you can describe that clearly, the what it is you want to convey, the so what, which is the implication of why it's important and what our opportunity is, and then the then what of what the future better state will be, then you've got a clear framing that you can now say, I, I'm going to take all my data to prove those points. And you want to make sure that you've done your homework to make sure that all of this is very valid and you're not torturing the data. I'll come to that on the next slide. But you want to make sure that this is legitimate and when you do follow it up with a data science approach, it will be proven to be true. So describe the opportunity, what's in front of you, list your data topics, color code, and say, I think the following things go together, and identify a theme for each color or word, like I did health, wealth, environment, those kinds of things. Right? And then group those topics into themes using a mind map, relate the topics and break them down in further detail with a concept map. And then you've got your first shot at it. And that will say, okay, I think that's reasonable. Or perhaps, you know, now that I've thought about it a little bit more, I really want, I think that this piece of data belongs in a different cluster or a different theme. Or I think now that I've done some of the connecting of the dots and linking themes together, I might come out with a whole new theme from the analysis of the concept maps that I've developed. So iterating through this step, set of steps helps clarify your thinking and also identifies where you might not have all the data that you need. You might discover that your business context, your business situation, your opportunity needs more data, for example, from the tourism industry, which wasn't necessarily part of our original mind map or our concept map. So how do things fit together? How best to cluster them to make the most compelling case? Also helps you identify things that might be missing also identifies some things that you might not need. You might not need to include, for example, the obesity rate in your analysis. And that's fine because it could be subordinate. And as you go through this visual approach, you could knock that down a couple levels in the hierarchy of the concept map so that you don't distract your audience with things that really might be interesting, but they're not central to your narrative. They're not central to your business case. And again, if you're speaking to executives, you don't want to distract them with minor details. You want them to keep them focused on, wow, isn't this a really good idea? And wow, I'm ready to write a check for you to proceed with your project and proposal. So after you've done a couple of iterations, and you might have three or four different versions of this coloring and mind map and concept map, you might have a couple of different ways to look at this. Step back and decide which iteration is best. And you can also use those working papers to check yourself, to share your work with some of your fellow analysts in the business, and also to check it with some of the folks who do data science and they know the data intricately and intimately uh, at the lowest levels of detail, and to see if it makes sense and lines up with their experience and their interpretations and their judgments. And you can do that in the earliest of stages before you put the idea forward so that you're validating at least you know, this group of people that you're working with agrees that this is a reasonable basis to proceed. And they can do that very quickly because you've laid this out visually and you're not taking them through a lot of algorithms. And again, it's just the initial review to make sure they're on a good path and you have explained those, uh, the what, 
so what, and now what, and then what, uh, in a compelling, concise manner that you're ready to take upstairs to the senior leadership team. The result will be that you've taken your pile of data, you've colored it, you've come up with a mind map, you've distilled that into themes that you'll be able to, by using the concept map, you'll be able to distill that into themes that you'll be able to put together as your final proposal. And then your proposal to that senior leadership team ideally will lead to, roger that, and let's go. What we don't want to do is hey, I've got an idea, and I know this is right. I don't really have any data for it yet, but I know I'm right. You know what you want to say, and I'm going to convince these guys because it's just the right thing to do, or so you think. You want to prove it's true, and then you're going to torture the data and fit it into your preconceived notions. Don't do that. <laughs> it will be, uh, it'll be a disservice to you and the organization and actually has a risk of subtracting value because you'll spend time building up a business case that may or may not exist. And worse, someone else might come forward with a, the approach that we've covered earlier in this presentation to refute your points and say, no, I don't see the data lining up that way and I've got some facts that will prove you wrong. So don't start with an artificial goal. Make sure you start with the mind map and you actually have an unbiased, open mind as you cluster your data into key themes. So finally, in summary, you've put together a really compelling data story. You've got some messages. You've got some facts. You're ready to ask the data science team to, to engage. And you've got to get approval to allocate their time to your approach. Now you have to take those three messages and your insights up to that senior leadership team that will approve you to move forward. To do that, you need to deliver your package as a narrative. That is going to be the subject of our next part two of our data webinar series in about two weeks. And how do we take that forward is really, once you've got your solid facts together and your messages and your themes, you really have to know your audience to convey it in a way that they will understand and appreciate it. You've got to command the room to make sure this presentation goes smoothly and ultimately end up with a request that will inspire them to action to say, yes, let's move forward. So we'll cover that in our next webinar, the Data Story How To Part Two, is targeting your audience, understanding what will resonate with them, and that's part corporate culture, and it's part audience personality, and how people like to think about things and be have things explained to them. They have communication preferences, and you want to make sure that you uh, adapt to those so that you deliver messages that resonate. And then preparing that delivery, how do you go into a room? What is your presence? What is your style? What is your body language? How do you handle silences? How do you handle mistakes? And then how do you close to inspire the action? But it all starts with the data story and clustering your data in a way that delivers uh, a data pile into three compelling messages that inspire them to say, let's move forward. So in conclusion, my point is that if you've got a story to tell, the data story is the bridge that inspires people to action. You've got a good idea. You've got facts that will back it up. You've got a way to sort those facts in a way that makes sense relative to that business situation and that audience. And you're ready to deliver that in a way that three points across the bridge inspires them to say yes. And that's what I hope you'll be able to do as a benefit from attending this webinar. I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jed. Um, super insightful. You know, I. Uh, I was sitting here smiling uh, when you uh, went over the uh, the part about knowing your audience, right? Um, to be bright, be brief, and then be gone. Um, and the reason why I put a grin on my face is, you know, we learned, you know, uh, you know, just a few years back that uh, when we delivered the outcome of our assessments, um, a lot of times that was an executive audience, 
And uh, initially we thought, you know, we really wanted to show that they got a lot of, you know, bang for their buck and we had a very comprehensive deck. And what we found is exactly like what you're saying. They, they wanted the punchline. And so we started adding a secondary deck um, called the executive summary and only presented that and then had the actual assessment deliverables, which sometimes can be 200 pages, right? Um, have that be a supplement and it really helped us engage with them so much more. So I, I just really love that piece about it. You know, one of the, the questions uh, that's been asked is, you know, from your experience, how long does it typically take to go from data pile to data insight? Great question. A lot of it can depend on the size of your pile, of course. But these techniques are designed to be quick. I would think that if you have your data summarized the way I have in those 13 facts, then you can do this in a couple of hours or an afternoon because the tools are just that quick. And you don't necessarily need to have a mind mapping or concept mapping tool. The whiteboard and a, and a crayon is the best tool that's ever invented for doing <laughs> some of this from the very beginning, right? And you can do this with a pencil and piece of paper, you can do a whiteboard with a marker. And it's just helpful to save it if you want to do it in a, as, a, as a tool, you can then save it and illustrate it for others and show it with others and change it over time. But I think the, the challenge might be if you have 13 different data sets and they line up with those facts and they summarize the facts that I presented there, it might take you a while to get to that. And if it does, or, or if it seems overwhelming to do that and you can't just line up the data and compute an average and those kinds of things, then I would say if you've been in your business and you've been in your environment for a while, you probably have some pretty good experience build up. Some people call it intuition. I don't call it intuition. I call it experience and judgment and the ability to interpret the data. And you might be able to say right off the bat that I think the average is this, and I think that some of the other facts that would, uh, the data sets would summarize to certain facts. Now, there's a risk in doing that. And you need to come go back and make sure you have your facts truly uh, understood and summarized arithmetically. But if you have the, the 13 level, the level of the 13 facts there, I can do this, and I think you could do this in a couple of hours to get the first cut at it. And then that will enable you to realize where you don't know the data as well, what you might be missing, where you might need more things that you can leave out. So the iteration aspect of this is important, and iterations can be done pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hours, minutes and hours, not not days and weeks. Okay, okay, very good. And, and that really, it leads to my second question is, you know, should you, in the example that you gave, we had 13 um, data points that we were working with. Should you limit, because you can imagine, right, especially in corporations, how much data they have to work with. Should you limit the volume that you're working with? Like, do you find that there's a sweet spot? Work with these many, this many attributes or these this many mm -hmm. data sets in order to be successful? Because I can imagine it could be, you know, hundreds, thousands, right? And it can get pretty um, overwhelming. Sure, and very complex, and then all the interrelationships, right? This technique doesn't scale to the hundreds of thousands of data sets, right? You really need data science for that. You need algorithms to be able to sort that and have definitive uh, relationships and patterns among the different data sets. This works well for maybe a couple of dozen uh, data sets or key facts. You can get into the 30 range, but then your iterations aren't taking minutes, they're taking hours, and they might take a full day, and it gets a little bit more cumbersome. So there are limitations to this, uh, to the visual approach. And if you, if you run into those types of things, typically I find that putting things together in smaller clusters first, that you might have 25 or 30 different data points, putting them into clusters of four or five first, then trying to unite them through a concept map might be uh, a more effective approach. Because if you cluster them in smaller groups, you might not get all the clusters right, but then if you put that back into a concept map and you draw the relationships across clusters, then you can see that perhaps things need to move. So you can use these techniques, not necessarily mind map first and concept map second, but you can invert that and identify other patterns to help it scale to a slightly larger level. But you're going to have to back this up by data science eventually. Mm -hmm. The whole intent here is to get the initial 
analysis done to build groundswell support to be able to deploy the resources of that expensive talent that you have called data scientists. Okay, very, very good. Thank you. Um, you know, when I was listening to the presentation, you know, I was taking notes on things that I wanted to ask, and and you must get asked this question a lot because you addressed it in, at the tail end of the presentation. Whereas, don't uh, let your own desires or wants skew the results, right? It's called perspective bias. <laughs> yeah, right. We all have, you know, we're all humans, right? So yeah. you can see if you really want something to get approved, how you might overlook maybe what the data is telling you. And you even see that in businesses, right? Everyone's like tweaking the data ever so slightly and then coming to those executive meetings with, with um, competing results, right? Um, have you ever, or would you recommend maybe giving the data to someone that doesn't know what you're trying to accomplish and give them the task of building the mind map or the concept map for you? and then reviewing the results so that you don't add a biased twist to the outcome. That's a great insight, Deborah, and I highly recommend that. Matter of fact, when I've been you know, in senior leadership roles within companies and we have something that's very big and important to do, I ask two of the top people to go look at this, don't talk to each other, right? Mm -hmm. I want two independent minds to look at it from two different perspectives to then bring it back together. You can do that a little bit by trying different iterations with the concept map and sorting things yourself. Highly recommend talking to someone else okay. and getting them to say, here's how I sorted it. Does this make sense to you? Shoot at it, tear it apart, break it down a different way, challenge me. And it's very, very absorbable when you've laid it out in a visual format. And they could say, no, move this over there, or man, I don't know what you're thinking. You need to come at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Highly important to do that because that's what's going to happen in senior leadership meeting when you go in. They're going to challenge you. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't thought about those different perspectives or perhaps something that you hadn't even thought about at all, if you've done your homework with a couple other people, as I mentioned earlier, that'll make you stronger. Mm -hmm. Great. And I love your, your twist on it, Jed, to have actually two people do the same exercise. I think, yeah. I think that that's really right. effective, right? right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know in my interactions with clients, more and more, right, um, large initiatives that are requiring, you know, big dollars, you know, multi-million dollar investments, even even smaller, right, in the hundreds of thousands, um, there has to be a business justification. And so we're seeing that more and more, and our clients are coming to us and saying, gosh, can you help us put this business case together? We really need to show business value. We need to show ROI. We need to show, you know, what we're going to gain from the investment. So I could see where, you know, so much of this applies to what people are doing every single day. So. Well, particularly to your point, Deborah, when you've got a big initiative in front of you, a lot of it, a lot of executives are saying, "Is this worth going after?" This is a good way to have a first quick look, based mm -hmm. upon what we know today, based upon our best experience, insight, and judgment. Our interpretation is, "Here's how it lines up. Here's where it could go." And it might be 50% right. It might also 50% be more than enough to convince the leadership that it's worth taking the next step. And that's what you really want to do. So a quick look, come up with something, you know, in a, in a day or two can inspire them to say, hey, you're the right person to take this forward. Mm -hmm. Think there's something there. Go do it. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Great career, career opportunity. And then you're going to be diligent, and then you're going to make sure you do the data science, <laughs> and you're going to make sure all the you have a defined, repeatable process, and the facts support your initial ideas. Or you're going to say, you know what? Here's our original concept, and we thought this. Now we've done some additional work, and it's a little different. And I'm going to show it to you, or at least in the working session. Here's how it affects our original concept map and mind map, and here's how it fits into that context. Or Maybe it doesn't, and you have to start over. But at least you've got a reference base there that says, here's the story I told you, here's what we found, and here's what I'm going to take forward differently than we originally thought. So it's a versatile tool to be able to interplay with the data science mm -hmm. in a way that people can grasp quickly. Absolutely. And I feel like, too, that given that you have been in your career in executive for many, many years, that we're kind of getting be brief, be the, brief, in, the inside it. scoop, right, <laughs> on, on how to be effective, right? If it's worth doing, how do you do it effectively? 
So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I know that on April 24th, um, Thursday at 11 a.m. Mountain, that we will be having part two. Um, so uh, we're very excited to now go the next level down and get even more granular in, in how this gets put together. So delivering in the room. A lot of people who are very good with data mm -hmm. get a little nervous in front of an audience. Mm -hmm. right? And that's that's challenging because you don't know what they're going to ask. They control not only your proposal, but perhaps your career because they're your superior officers. Mm -hmm. And what we want to talk about is how to overcome that to present with confidence in a way that inspires them that you're the right person and you're, you're, that idea is worth pursuing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, too, like when you come across in an audience like that, especially an executive audience, you have to be passionate. You have to be really believe in what you're trying to convey. And then just like what you're saying, you got to have the data to back it up. You got to have the facts straight. So really looking forward to that. So April 24th, it's a Tuesday. A lot of times we have our educational webinar series hosted on Thursday, but it's going to be Tuesday, just like today. So uh, we hope that you will tune in for that. Um, we had a number of people ask if the presentation would be made available, the slides. Um, what we do is we record this session and it's posted on our website. So if you want to review it yourself a couple of times, if you want to share the link with colleagues or leadership, um, that will be available to you. So um, one quick correction. Yeah. I think our last slide says Thursday the 24th. It's going to be Tuesday oh. the 24th. My mistake. My, thank my you. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Tuesday. Yes. Yeah, so a little bit of a correction there. So mark your calendars Tuesday. April 24th, not Thursday. So apologize for that little typo there. So um, it happens. <laughs> so um, lastly, you know, um, I know that we do a number of these types of workshops, right? Half day workshops. If you feel like you would like a little bit of, um, you know, uh, support in developing uh, data storage, storytelling, building your business case, figuring out God, how do I do this? Um, that is something that we offer. So um, keep that in mind. And with that, thank you everyone for attending. And Jed, uh, especially a huge thank you to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, great take care. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.